I think Metroid Prime was the first game I ever played with a first person camera. This is kind of scary for an 8 year old. This fucking dinosaur is gonna rip my limbs off. It's far from the first first person shooter though. The first person perspective has been around in the video game development world for a long time actually. In 1973, some really cool student turbo nerds developed a game called Maze War at a NASA student research program. It got popular amongst their friends and peers and eventually they developed a build that they played with each other over ARPANET instead of studying or having unprotected sex with college girls or whatever. This obviously wouldn't be the last multiplayer first person shooter and ARPANET would eventually evolve into the internet that we know today, but I'm not here to give you a history lesson, I'm here to play the funny rabbit game on the PS1. Jumping Flash. I really like this title screen, this is what you see when you die and you go to the afterlife. Jumping Flash was developed by Ultra and Exact, two teams that it's hard to find a lot of information about now because their names are so non-specific, and they're both defunct now. But Exact stood for Excellent Application Create Team, and they had a pretty solid run in the 90s making shit for Sony, including that Ghost in the Shell game that you really like to bring up when your friends talk about Ghost in the Shell to distract from the fact that you haven't watched it yet, you fucking poser. Before Jumping Flash, Exact also developed Geograph Seal and put it out for the Sharp X68000 computer in 1994. Looking at the footage, it's pretty easy to see where the blueprints for Jumping Flash came from. Very impressive to me that they put out a game with such discernible 3D graphics on such rudimentary hardware. I'm always impressed by this type of shit. Like that Super Monkey Ball demake on GBA had no right to be as competent as it was. This shit is basically a portable Super Nintendo and this is a legit 3D game running completely fine on it. Star Fox on SNES is similarly impressive to me, but I'm not enough of a contrarian to say that I actually like playing that game. I'm sorry. It's fun to turn on for 45 seconds and go, wow, look at the graphics. Then I just turn it off and play F-Zero instead. Forgive me, Star Fox 1 enjoyers. I respect you, but I am not one of you. Ultra was best known at the time for doing the CG in Ugu Ugu Ruga, which was some weird Japanese comedy show that aired in the early 90s. I didn't know fucking shit about this. It had animated bumpers in between live action segments, and it seemed to be made for pretty young children. I watched a few episodes on YouTube with automatically translated subtitles and had a good time, but I obviously couldn't really understand what most of it was about. It's basically just a bunch of rapid fire sketches and segments with a lot of stylized editing and random random shots of people in the street saying the show's name. Ooga, ooga, ooga. Happy New Year's. Happy New Year's. Love and peace. And hair grease. <laughs> the way they distort people's faces and add in silly sound effects kind of reminds me of like, I don't know, Tim and Eric. I really dug this tiny music video segment in the back half of one of the episodes I watched. This song sounds fucking awesome, but it only plays for like 30 seconds before moving on. You can see more of Ultra's fingerprint during sections like this. I liked this shit. I doubt I'll be successful in finding it, but I might try to find a torrent of the show online with English subtitles later on or something. If any of you fuckers watching this know where I can find it, please hit me up about it. Okay, side note here, I ended up getting really distracted by Ugo Ugo Ruga for a few days and went down a bit of a rabbit hole trying to find this fucking song. I found out that it's a house cover of this Japanese children's nursery rhyme called Bun Bun Bun, and it's about bees or something. I found a bunch of versions of it online. Coming with the pull up for the number one spot. 
but the version used in the actual show, this slick and funky house cover, continued to elude me. I checked every resource I could think of. I looked on 4chan's music board archive, I checked Soulseek and every sketchy website I could think of or stumble across, but fucking nobody had ever uploaded this version of this song. It took me a while to even identify it in the first place, because I only had a translated Japanese Wikipedia article about the show to cite, and I basically just went through every single song listed until I came across this version of Bun Bun Bun. I'm pretty sure the vocals are performed by Masanori Taki, who's the mastermind behind Denki Groove, if any of you are familiar with that project. I think part of the reason why I had so much fucking trouble figuring all this out is because Pony Canyon, the Japanese music label and TV station that both hosted Ugu Ugu Ruga and released physical editions of Denki Groove albums back in the day, seems to have completely scrubbed any and all reference to Taki, because he got caught doing fucking coke. Kids? If you're listening, don't do cocaine. It'll make you so fucking annoying for everyone around you. So it turns out I was mistaken about Masanori Taki being involved with Sample Battlers, but I kept the bit in about him getting busted doing coke because I thought it was funny. Sample Battlers was made up of these three musicians here. So thankfully a buddy of mine offered to purchase the CD from a warehouse in China that happened to have it. I was pretty anxious, I felt bad that they offered to spend a not light amount of money on something that I couldn't really 100% confirm was indeed the song I I so desperately wanted to hear, but I had to just wait for it to arrive. It had to be the song, right? It had to be. There's no way with all my searching and all the things relating this to Ugu Ugu Ruga that it'd be a different version of the song, right? It had to be what I was looking for, right? Yes. Holy shit, yes. My friend very selflessly got their hands on volume 1 and 2 of the Sample Battlers EPs. Volume 3 has never been sold on Discogs ever, and it's unfortunately likely that we'll never hear what was on it. But I'm really, really happy we were able to unearth this obscure piece of 90s Japanese music history. I've uploaded volume 1 and 2 separately on a burner YouTube account that I used to regularly post music on. The link is in the description if any of you are as invested in this as me and want to hear it for yourself. Volume 1 is pretty good as well. The first track is a house cover of Mary Had a Little Lamb, and the final track features some really funny ad libs from the vocalist. I love Japan! I love sushi! I love sukiyaki! Wooga wooga ruga! 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 But yeah, again, really happy to unearth this weird little fucking gem. The CDs came with some cute comics drawn by Yutsuko Chuzonji, who was a manga artist that was known for drawing a lot of Oyagi gals. Which if you don't know what that is, it's like young office ladies that act like gruff old men because they're surrounded by them all day. She apparently died in 2005. Rest in peace, queen. She did a manga called Sweet Spot that looks pretty cute. It got an OVA in 1991 and it's about this lady that loves golfing. It's on YouTube, I'll link it in the description. Chuzonji seemed to be a huge Westabu. She loved America and spent some time in New York and Atlanta, and even wrote a book about her experiences that I can't find anywhere online, unfortunately. But her fascination and passion for Western culture, hip hop, and America kind of ties back to the ethos of Ugu Ugu Ruga. I mentioned before that it was made as a children's show, but it was clearly a lot more than that to the people that worked on it. Toshio Iwa was the head honcho of this project, and he stated that he wanted to convey the values of the world and the diversity of its people, while considering that children are actually relatively mature, and I respect the fuck out of that. Kids aren't stupid, and any piece of media that acknowledges that and tries to engage with them at that level instead of just pandering to them and jangling keys in front of their face is going to be cherished and appreciated by them.傘の骨組みが完成したら今度はそこに紙を貼っていく。ここで使われるのが和紙と呼ばれる特別な紙。一枚一枚丁寧に和紙を糊で貼り付けていく。おじゃ、自分でいっちゃおかしいけど意地が
Everybody that worked on this obviously had a lot of respect for the western arts and hip-hop culture and shit. It's nice to see a program for kids in Japan back then that featured foreigners so prominently and proudly. I think a good comparison over here is Sesame Street, teaching kids that different people exist, different skin colors, languages, cultures, etc. I think it's an evergreen idea for little kids to be taught to empathize with people that look and sound different from them. Anyway, yeah, all of this shit doesn't really have anything to do with Jumping Flash, but all of this information was just scraping around inside of my skull and I felt like sharing it. You clicked the fucking video, alright? You're in my world now. <laughs> Ultra's work on Ugo Ugo Ruga and other shit had obviously gotten the attention of Tetsuji Yamamoto, Jumping Flash's producer and also a big name at Sony Computer Entertainment in the 90s, and they were tasked with doing the graphics and animations for it while Exact handled the programming and game design to my understanding. Jumping Flash has a really distinct visual style, it must have been so much fun to be an Ultra employee during the creation of this project. You can tell they all had a lot of fun modeling random shit and making lots of wacky looking textures to make up the environments here. Jumping Flash is often cited as the first 3D platformer, but I've always hesitated to call it that. I think the definition of platformer is a little too vague. There are a lot of games that precede Jumping Flash that feature, for lack of a better word, platforming. The previously mentioned Geograph Seal, for instance. Star Wars Dark Forces came out before Jumping Flash 2, and I wouldn't really call it a platformer because I'm not a smug, smarmy motherfucker. You can fucking jump in that game too. Alpha Waves is probably a better fit for the title of first 3D platformer, but maybe that game stretches your definition of the word video game because it wasn't released on a home console. I don't know. I don't really even care about all this shit, I just bring it up because whenever people talk about Jumping Flash, they love to go, um, did you know this is the first 3D platformer? I'm not especially interested in the semantics and specifics of this discussion. Fucking sure, Jumping Flash can be the first 3D platformer. It does precede Mario 64 and Crash and Bubsy 3D and shit. I I think a better way to describe it would be a very forward-thinking game that kind of precedes 3D platformers. That's not as snappy as what everybody else calls it, so I don't fucking care anymore anyway. I mean, really, I never really think about the game the same way that I think about other 3D platformers of the time. I don't know if it's the first-person camera or the shooting mechanics or what, but to this day I feel like there's still nothing out there quite like Jumping Flash. It's a really unique feeling game, and I'm gonna try to make it look really cool so you download a ROM of it online and play it for a few days and have fun. Bitches. Sup, bitches. It's Chad Warden here. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say is that jumping flash, baby. That shit is nice. Yeah, I need to shoot some news. So starting the game up, we're greeted by a cutscene. Some Hawaiian shirt wearing fuck is stealing a bunch of worlds, throwing them into the sky, and turning them into some weird fucking tourist space resort or some shit. This is the least a plot has mattered in a game that I've reviewed on this channel so far. All that matters is that we've got to stop him. We're playing as this robotic rabbit called Robbit. Really creative. Yeah, I really like his design a lot, it's really iconic and memorable and cute to me. He makes me laugh with his cute little dancing icon at the bottom of the screen and he sounds like Trey Parker. All right. Dude, you're so retarded. Jumping Flash makes a really good first impression. The first level is a lot to take in, and it gives you a lot of space to run around in. The setup is pretty simple. You find four carrot booster things in every level and then make your way to the exit. Once you start a level, there's a timer that starts counting down, but during your first run of the game, it gives you plenty of time to find all the carrots and get out. There are lots of wacky enemies. Look at these fucking guys. And this guy. What do you think of him? I like him. <laughs> I really enjoy seeing all of these vaguely related 3D models in the environment in this first level. I love the scale of certain things like this little house here. It reminds me of that weird area in Mario 64 that you're supposed to parse as being a little town, but because of the way that everything is scaled it just feels like a little room. Early 3D games graphics took a minute to adjust to things like scale and perception for the viewer, and it's just kind of funny seeing such early stuff like this. It's fun though, I love the way that this game looks a lot, especially love the skybox with the clouds moving really fast. So we've got to find four jet pods and get out of here. Cool, let's run around a bit. Ready to go? Okay, holy shit. So we can't strafe at all. We can walk forwards and backwards and turn our direction with left and right on the D-pad. This setup doesn't take too long to get used to at all, although my muscle memory sometimes had me reaching for the right stick on my gamepad to change direction at first. I like the way the game feels to control, and it feels adequately designed with the control scheme in mind, even though you've got to do this parallel parking bullshit sometimes if you need to change directions quickly for whatever reason. First level's great. We finish it no problem and continue to the next one. I like that each three-level world is pretty consistent with its themes. Like 
like the first world is like a uh, normal outdoorsy nature locale with the second level being centered around volcanoes and lava they still get pretty silly with it a lot of the time too with shit like these fried eggs in a pan being cooked over this volcano i really like this game's sense of humor a lot it made me laugh to myself a couple of times despite its minimal dialogue or story or anything it's just a funny game to run around in you've probably noticed from my footage and also the title of the fucking game if you're a real super sleuth that jumping is a big part of this shit robert can double and even triple jump and it's fucking awesome. You get some really good height in these levels, and some of them have a lot of verticality to explore. It's really fun. Robin even jumps off the exit into the sky at the end of every level. The jumping is handled really, really well by making the camera pan down below you every time you execute a double or triple jump, with your shadow being really big and obvious below you so you always know where you're gonna land. And depending on whether or not you're holding down the jump button changes your movement options from rotating to mid-air directional movement. And you just kind of intuit this when you're playing naturally. It's really smartly designed and it feels good. You rarely Rarely, if ever, feel like you die unfairly in this game. And it's a lot of fun to gain a fuck ton of height and just see what your landing options are on the way down. The main selling point of this game is how fun it is to jump around in these big sprawling levels and said levels just continue to get bigger and more elaborate the further you get into the game, for the most part. <laughs> After we finish World 1 and we get halfway through World 2, we're given a corridor labyrinth type level inside of a pyramid, and it's kind of like playing a weird, stupid version of Wolfenstein. That's what the Nazis look like in this game? I mean, yeah, okay. How is id Software supposed to predict that they'd all be wearing thigh highs 30 years later? I don't think it's that bad now, but when I first played this game as a kid, I distinctly remember quitting the game to play something else when I got to this level. It's not as fun when you can't jump everywhere, you gotta look around for jet pods, and it's kinda hard to hone in on them because of all the walls and hallways and the enemies that respawn when you get far away from them. It's just not the best level. Thankfully there's only two levels like this in Jumping Flash, the rest of them are all a lot more fun, but again, I don't really mind them now. They're decent pace breakers and it feels good to finish them and get back to the really fun shit. All right. All right, Robert, we got to the exit. Wait, 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 we're indoors. You're gonna crash your head into the ceiling, get a concussion. What are you doing? Okay, okay, there's a fucking hole. Never mind. We're good. World 3 introduces this theme park locale to the game. The first level is nice with its small obstacle courses up high in the sky, introducing a bit more risk and more opportunities to fall to our deaths here. This castle is cute. But level 2 is where things get really crazy with these roller coaster tracks that automatically propel us in one direction. Fucking giraffes and shit up here. Again, a lot of this shit is just seemingly pretty random. It's just fun and kind of indicative of that weird Japanese comedic mindset. This is a very Japanese game. It's funny that it was once called the reason to buy a PlayStation back in the day. Since it was such an early title for the console releasing within its launch window, this was a lot of people's introduction to the PS1 and I just think it's so endlessly interesting to speculate about what this shit did to people, kids and adults alike, in fucking 1995. This shit predates fucking Toy Story, it must have felt like such a crazy trip, you know? Like imagine you're a little kid and you've never seen Toy Story before, and your mom comes home with a new PlayStation system, and she sets it up in your- uh, uh, I just accidentally punched myself in the fucking nuts. <coughs> World 3's boss amps up the weird factor quite a bit with this fucking clown guy coming out of all these teacups and shooting leg hairs at you like a tarantula. I apologize if showing footage of a tarantula spooked some of my more sensitive viewers, but I'm also not that sorry because they're fucking cool. Did you know that they do this? They shoot out hairs from their abdomens and they get stuck in the predator's skin. It's like a bunch of tiny harpoons, but most predators don't have a fucking plasma blaster like Robin here, so we get through this shit fine. Goodbye, bitch. It's always fun to watch the boss spin around once you deplete their HP all the way down. It's cute that they make it a big spectacle every time with them exploding and shit at the end. It's similarly fun to shoot enemies in the overworld and watch them shatter into a hundred pieces. You can get through this game basically avoiding most of these guys because they rarely ever pose any kind of threat to you. I only really ever got hit by these Darth Maul flower guys that shoot seeds at you. But you're really only going to have a problem with these guys if you're really careless. This is a fairly easy, chill ass game to play through. I'm glad I decided to make a video about this shit, it's a game that I've played multiple times before, but I always grow to appreciate a game more when I do this shit. It's a lot of fun making these videos. Thanks for uh, liking them and watching and shit. Anyway, I guess before we move on to the next world, I can talk about the UI a little bit. I love a lot of what's going on here. The rear view mirror trinket thing hanging at the center of the top of the screen is always indicating what type of motion you're in. For example, it stretches a bit downward whenever you're ascending during a jump, and it springs back up when you start to slow down as you reach the peak and slow down again. It's fun to watch it balance when you do double and triple jumps. You can also see 
you the names of any items that you pick up, but the only one that's actually useful during regular level gameplay is the time stop item. It freezes time for like 10 seconds or something, and then it shows you where all the remaining jet pods are in each level. Hugely beneficial if you're in a bigger level and you can't for the life of you find that damn fourth jet pod. I like that you can hold the trigger and shift your view in place without moving. It kind of feels like holding Samus's arm in Metroid Prime. You can look all around and even down at your feet. I like seeing Robert shuffle his feet while you rotate around. It's a cute detail. World 4 is an ice themed one. The first level is one of the ones that stick out to me the most, with lots of places to jump to and the slippy, slidey ice physics when you're running around on the ground surface. But level 2 does the fucking labyrinth thing again, and it's even more convoluted than the first one. It isn't that bad in your first playthrough, but when you play the game a second time in extra mode, you're given significantly less time to find all of the jet pods and exit the level. So this one tripped me up quite a bit during that playthrough. It's kind of easy to get lost, and not necessarily in a fun way. The game rewards you when you beat normal mode and extra mode without using any continues though, by giving you a game mode where you have infinite jumps, and it's great. The music in level 2 is weirdly ominous and stressful sounding too. The whole level just kind of feels like you're having a nightmare where you're late for work, and then you wake up and realize you haven't had a job at McDonald's in years. But then you realize you forgot to set your alarm and you're late for your current job at the dick sucking factory and your manager is going to be oh so cross with you and they find all the unsucked dicks at your station in a few minutes. But you know what, it's, it's fucking chill. Other than these two problem areas, the rest of the game is genuinely fantastic, and these two are pretty much just slightly less fantastic. This world's boss is a big turtle tank thing and he shits out a bunch of little bombs, but they're really easily avoidable. In games like these you almost feel bad for all the enemies or bosses because of how powerful you are and how ineffective most of them are at doing anything to us. Like we're an ancient god raining down retribution on a helpless people that have no way of fighting back. World 5 introduces itself with a big city level, but it's got a really unique atmosphere because of how empty it all is. Like it's really really early in the morning and no one has left their house to take the train to get to work yet. I like the way the big buildings look, just another really memorable level in this game full of memorable levels. After playing this shit a few times I actually had a dream that I was wandering around in this level specifically, walking down these long, empty, solemn roads. It wasn't really a nightmare or anything, and nothing interesting happened, but I woke up the next day and just continued thinking about this game for days afterward. Jumping Flash is just one of those games that really sticks with you, even in my own life. With the limited amount of time that I had played it before I decided to do a video about it, it was always a game that my thoughts would often return to. I just like existing in this game, it's really, really pleasant. Okay, World 6 is a unique one. There's only one level to explore and two boss fights back to back. The level you get to explore is the biggest one in the game, with it taking place up above the Earth's atmosphere with these square structures that remind me a lot of Mad Space and Meteor Hurt from Sonic Adventure 2. I find it pretty hard to not assume that this level is a direct inspiration for that shit, unless I'm missing something obvious here that both of these games were simultaneously referencing or something. Maybe I'm a fucking idiot. We just don't know. This level is easily the most fun one so far though, with lots to do and explore and a whole lot of jumping that you've got to do in between these structures. The game expects you to have mastered these simple mechanics by now and it does a good job letting you bask in the reward of utilizing said mechanics to the fullest. We Ah fuck, I broke my fucking legs. I also just really love the spectacle of this level and world. It's cool seeing that awesome sky texture at the bottom of the screen instead of the top like it has been the entire game so far. The penultimate boss fight is against Dark Robit. I don't know if that's actually their name, but I fucking love boss fights against evil doppelganger characters. Phantom Mario, Shadow Link, Metal Sonic. This type of shit will never stop being cool to me. The fight itself is also the first one to actually be kind of challenging. It's still not giving you that hard of a time, but it's fun to fight another character that possesses the same abilities you have. It feels so fucking embarrassing for him to jump on your head like this. Hey asshole, I'm the one that's supposed to be doing this shit. Fuck you, get down from there. I'm gonna fucking kill you. 
as soon as I rotate another 90 degrees. The final boss is against Baron Aloha, and I absolutely adore the visuals and the environment here. The little arena feels very Final Destination y, and I love seeing the horizon spin around us. This fight is kind of a little bit easier than the Dark Rabbit fight, to be honest, though. It only becomes a bit harder when you get his HP down really low and he starts bouncing all over the place like an asshole. Really good shit all around, though. I love that after you beat the game, the credits shows all the animated FMVs. Lots of games show off all the FMV cutscenes in the credits like this, but this one always makes me laugh because there are so few cutscenes to work with that the team just said, ah, fuck it, who cares? Just YouTube poop that shit. <laughs> I'm not editing this at all. They really just play the same shit and play it in reverse and cut it up like this. It's really, really good. It's a good bit. So I mentioned before that once you beat the game, you have to beat it again to unlock the infinite jump mode. What else is there to talk about? Well, for starters, there was a whole second game, actually. Jumping Flash 2! Big Trouble in Little Moo! Oh, I get it! I get jokes! <laughs> I never actually played Jumping Flash 2 before I decided to make this video. I didn't even know a sequel existed for a really long time, which is weird to me considering how much of a landmark the first game is. This shit came out so quickly after the first game too, like literally both of these games still predate Mario 64. So what gives? I guess the unfortunate truth is that Jumping Flash 2 is basically just the same game again. It feels a lot more like an expansion pack than a sequel, and I guess critics raked it over the coals a little bit because of that back in the day. Now, Personally, I'm fucking thrilled to play more levels, but I guess this was too little too soon? This shit sold almost as well as the first game, but I guess they were expecting this shit to blow up just a little bit more than it did, when basically everybody was just like, yeah, I get it already. Whatever. Say la fucking V. I speculate that it was fairly easy to make Jumping Flash 2 based on what they had already made for the first game. The two problem areas are even positioned in the exact same way, leading me to believe that they made the levels in this game based on the first one entirely. Not knocking them for it, it's smart to streamline any process you possibly can when making a project as big as a fucking video game. But it's a shame that it didn't sell better. I would love to live in a timeline where we're on fucking Jumping Flash 9 by now, and all the games have been re-released on modern consoles and PC, and there's a big community behind speedrunning this game and beating each other's times and shit. Fucking online multiplayer co-op, a cartoon spin-off, an edgy reboot in 2011 that sells like shit, the works. But I won't mourn it too heavily. It's better to die out on a high note than last too long under mediocrity. But for now, sure, yeah, let's play Jumping Flash 2. In this game, there's this big guy that looks like a banana, and he's basically just doing the same shit that Baron Aloha did in the first game. And Baron Aloha is pissed off that somebody's plagiarizing him, so he calls Robert to come fuck his shit up. Let's do it! Take that! Aw oh man, Robert's balls dropped for this one, everybody. It's weird hearing a grown man's voice coming out of this weird fucking rabbit combat droid now. I kind of miss when he sounded like a rug rat, but at least his death scream is the funniest shit I've ever heard in my life now. Awesome. Jumping Flash 2 is peak Jumping Flash. Every level is a lot bigger and more fun to run around in, and they're really creative with the environments this time. It's a lot more weird shit like this snowy Japanese shrine and this floating industrial area. Yeah, eat your fucking heart out, Mario. We had 3D green pipes here first. I mentioned earlier that the two crappy labyrinth levels were in the same positions as the first game, because again, I theorized that this game was built directly off of the first one. But damn, even these levels are a lot better in this game. They're actually really fun to explore this time around. They definitely figured everything out for this game. It's amazing to see growth and exacts game design philosophy in such a short amount of time. This game's fucking awesome. It's probably better than the first one. The bosses and enemies are even a bit more difficult to add some more excitement and stakes here. It's still not going to give you a fucking testicular torsion or anything, but it's a welcome step up from the first game on the difficulty front. I don't really feel like going through each level and describing them all to you, but look at how cool this level is with the big towers and rain and shit. Phenomenal. Where's that clip of David Lynch where he goes, Phenomenal. Phenomenal. If you like Jumping Flash and you haven't played the sequel, I violently and desperately beg you to try it out. You'll absolutely love it. The final level especially is such a treat. Even bigger and wackier than the first game's final level.
Look, the first level of this shit has kiwis flying on paragliders. Holy fuck, look at him go. He's kicking his little feet too. Oh, that's fucking precious. In Jumping Flash 2, you find these little Moo Moo guys that are Baron Aloha's little familiars or whatever. I think I prefer them to the jet pods. They add a little more personality because they all have different facial expressions and they get added to your screen every time you find one and they dance with Robin and shit. This game's gonna make me have a fucking heart attack. It's so good. Jumping Flash 2 is just really refreshingly weird and fun. I like the design of the Moo Moo's a lot too. They remind me of Studio Pixel's little squid guys. They're great. Jumping Flash 2 is just the first game, but more and kind of better. They're both fantastic and you can beat both of them in the same day probably. Also, I completely fucking forgot to mention this while talking about either of these games, so I'll cram it in here, but every level in this game has a bonus stage that you can enter by finding these bonus rings like in Sonic 3. They're fun. They all involve you popping all the balloons in the stage before the timer runs out. They're enjoyable, a nice distraction, and a good way to get your score up if you care about that shit. I tried to watch as many video reviews of this game as I could before making this shit so I could try to not repeat what everybody else says too much, but shockingly few people have made videos about these games actually. I did find a couple of reviews, and some of them that I found complained about the bonus levels and said that the shooting feels bad or whatever, which I don't really understand that much. I don't really get criticizing the shooting mechanic in Jumping Flash. It's fun to shoot stuff, are you not into the fact that shit doesn't hit scan like in Doom? That's stupid. This game's fun, and shooting stuff in it is fun. I guess before I wrap this shit up, I should talk about what ended up happening to this IP. Exact's final game ended up being that Ghost in the Shell one I mentioned earlier, and Ultra ended up rebranding to Moo Moo Company Limited, after the Moo Moo's from the games, obviously. Under this name, they lasted until 2007 or so, the final game they contributed towards being a Japan-only puzzle game that I've never heard of before, but it looks kinda cool. But after Jumping Flash 2, the IP was handed off to Sugar and Rockets, who I guess is one of the teams credited on Intelligent Cube, that terrifying fucking game where you can watch a tiny man get crushed to death. The demo of this game that was on the PS1 demo disc had no music, so it came off really unsettling and was probably the source of many nightmares for many, many 90s babies. Good. Sugar and Rockets developed a spin-off and a de facto third Jumping Flash game? Both were Japan only, no English releases. Pocket Moo Moo was a spin-off that utilized the short-lived Pocket Station, a memory card peripheral that reminds me of the Dreamcast VMU a lot. This shit was also only in Japan, but basically in Pocket Moo Moo, if I'm not mistaken, you'd play little mini games on the Pocket Station and gain money to build a theme park or some shit in the real game. I'm not super confident on this, I could be wrong, and I'll fully admit that I wasn't interested enough to research this one any more than I did, because the actual game I was curious about was Robert Mondieu. The phrase Japanese only Jumping Flash 3 was way more tantalizing to me and I was super curious to check it out despite there being no English patch out there to make this shit easier for me to understand and digest. Robert Mondieu is a puzzling game. I like a lot of things about it. Robert is gold in this one and that makes me weirdly happy, like he's been upgraded after saving the world two times. This one is weirdly a lot more story focused with a whole bunch of cutscenes and new characters and shit. There's a cutscene at the beginning and end of every level which I appreciate a lot, but but I unfortunately can't fully enjoy what's going on here for obvious reasons. I kind of pieced together that Robert is here to solve various problems for all the people living here. Robert Mondieu features a mission-based structure with each level having a different objective. I kind of compare this in my head to the chaotic story in Sonic Heroes versus the rest of the teams just getting to the exit of every level. This isn't a terrible idea on paper, but it's just kind of boring in its execution here. It's always like, bring the little frog guy to his house, jump on all these targets, defeat all the ghosts, fucking whatever. The cutscenes are cute and shit too, but they often last longer than the actual levels themselves and it just kind of makes me go why did they bother like this is the super monkey ball adventure of jumping flash where i appreciate the idea of a game like this on paper but the juice is kind of lost in the process i'd like this game a lot more if the levels were bigger with more stuff to do if everything was paced out a little bit better so i'm not watching cutscenes that are as long as the levels themselves but i'm not gonna rip this shit to shreds over it people barely even know about this game as is i'm mixed on the visuals as well part of me really likes them a lot they're cute and everything is expertly modeled and the art style is great and shit kind of reminiscent of Ape Escape almost, but to me, it also feels like it has a lot less charm than the first two games, like some of the personality has been sanded off. I'm not saying it's an ugly game or anything, it's still very nice, and something was definitely lost here. I don't know, it's still a cute game, but it's kind of a disappointing end to the franchise. I'd still love to see this shit get translated with an English patch by some dedicated fans one day, but I'm not exactly holding my breath. What I played of Robert Mondieu I really enjoyed and I overall admire it a lot, but I definitely prefer the structure and overall experience of the first two games a lot more. Also, what the 
the fuck kind of title is this shit? Robert Mondieu? Robert My God? Did they name the title after what Robert's wife screams in bed every night? And that's it. I understand that Sony occasionally references Jumping Flash with whatever the fuck this shit is, but otherwise it's probably never getting another game. It'd be really cool to see something new one day, but again, I'm not holding my breath. There are definitely fans of this series. I even found this random guy on Steam that had the audacity to make a store page for Jumping Flash 4 and is just going like, please, please hire me to make Jumping Flash 4, please. Oh my god. Do not hire this man. But despite how important Jumping Flash is in the history of 3D video games, it seems to be pretty much forgotten. And I think that's a shame. So try these games out, they're really good. They're a lot of fun, and I think anybody could have a great time with them. Okay, I thought I was done making this video, but I discovered Forza Pulpo like yesterday and I want to talk about it extremely briefly. So Forza Pulpo is an indie game that I guess has been in development for the past few years. It was finally released commercially about a year ago and barely anybody has heard about it or talked about it. My roommate randomly found it and showed it to me and I was like, oh shit. On the surface, it looks like an indie take on Jumping Flash, so that, you know, it pertains to this video. It's definitely not a straight up clone of Jumping Flash, there's way too many differences in the gameplay and design, but it's very clearly inspired by it. You play as a robot rabbit thing, and you can triple jump and shit. It's actually a lot of fun. It feels very different from Jumping Flash, but it's fun in a lot of similar ways. I had to turn down the effects in the options menu because the flashing glitch effects that the developer likes to use a lot gave me a bit of a headache, but I really like the visuals and aesthetics of this shit. It's not the most unique looking game ever, but I always like when indie devs are clearly visually inspired by Katamari Damacy. The basic setup of this game is that you have to collect three key cubes and return to the entrance in every level, pretty much just like Jumping Flash. You can jump three times, and you can even hover to slow your descent, but it'll drain your HP. Your HP gets drained from jumping too much, floating too much, shooting too much, or falling too hard on the ground, but you collect these little pink cylindrical orbs and use them to recharge your energy. There's also this anime girl in your brain telling you to do stuff, so if you want to truly experience what it's like being your favorite irreparably brain damaged YouTuber in real life, you should peep this shit. I probably sound so shitty right now. I just woke up. I'm gonna put this fucking video out tomorrow. I really like a lot of the details here. You have to like virtually connect to the little rabbit robot thing in your computer, but you can disconnect and look around your bedroom and make kissy faces at your beautiful anime wife. This game's really fun. It's a teeny bit rough around the edges. Jumping Flash feels like a very tightly and intentionally designed game where this one involves you kind of sliding around all over the place and trying to grapple with the physics a little bit. They're fundamentally quite different, but I wouldn't say this game has bad controls. I highly recommend checking this shit out. Throw this Dev bone. 15 bucks isn't bad for what's on offer here in my opinion. I'll probably talk about this game a little bit more and having fun on the computer for. Yeah, of course I'm making a fucking fourth one. I think that's actually it. Good night. Good morning. Whatever. Thanks for watching. <laughs>